Welcome to the Come Up Starter Kit, guys. Do we have an exciting episode today? We have a whole lot of issues to talk about, especially within the cybersecurity world. And I have Raki Samasekra, who is going to be the man that discusses that. And let me introduce him. Now, Raki is a cybersecurity lead with over 19 years of experience in the financial services, transportation, and logistic companies across Australia and the UK. Having started his career within PWC as a consultant, then moving on to working on some notable programs of work, such as success building out business cases for multi-million dollar cybersecurity programs of work, including gap analysis and scope for improved operational technology, physical systems like fire suppressions in a tunnel. Raki has also extensive experience across NIST, cloud security, providing architectural strategies across multi-cloud environments, and finally, international delivery of data loss protection and mobile payment solutions, respectively. Now, that is a mouthful, Raki. Welcome on board. Thanks, Shankar. Thanks for the intro. Wonderful. Now, guys, we're going to kick right into it. I think that what's happened at the moment, Australia is definitely seeing some adversity when it comes to cybersecurity. And I think that we need to address what is actually going on. So I'm going to kick right into it. Raki, as we have seen recently with companies such as Medibank, Woolworths, Energy Australia that have large cybersecurity teams with these CISOs on huge salaries, why do you think that they are unable to stop these attacks? I mean, the short answer of that really is that cybersecurity is hard. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. pretty, it's it's difficult, right? Like, um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you the, the long spiel of it. Like, it, it, it's a bit of a cliche in the industry, but um, it's still true, um, which is that the attackers just have to find one weakness in your systems. Um, and the defenders really, which is where I really play in most of the, the cyber community, um, we have to defend it all, right? Like. So th that's what makes it hard, right? Like attackers, they don't have to adhere to laws or ethics or user experience or worry about system downtime, you know? And these days, uh, a lot of it is sort of nation states or it's criminal crews that, you know, also do some work for nation states and they have a lot of resources behind them, right? And if, especially if they're doing a targeted attack, um, you know, they, they have a lot of time as well. Um, whereas like, you know, on the defensive side, you, you're just like any other, you know, it, it's just the reality of the world, right? Like, you're basically a cost center in technology, usually, um, you know, if the company invests in cyber, um, you know, the, the, the real world is a real world, right? Like every dollars are limited, resources are limited. Um, yeah. And if you're going to spend that dollar on cyber, that means you're not going to spend it maybe, you know, chasing your next revenue idea, fixing a customer problem, you know, reducing your cost. So, you know, uh, and then like the third fact I think is like just human psychology, right? Like right. we are just really, really bad. Like um, excellent book I like is a Daniel Kahneman book called Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. And he's yeah. got really good, really good examples of like why human sort of psychology is bounded rationality at best case, right? So it means we're more scared of a terrorist attack than a car crash, even though every day you drive your car, you're more likely to get into a car crash, right? Like if you're like over 70, you're more likely to break your hip falling in the bath than, you know, doing anything else. But it's just so okay. ordinary, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. it, okay. it, it doesn't register. Uh, it's those spectacular events, no matter how rare they are, that really register. So we put it in a company context, the executives and the directors kind of think, can this really happen to me? Like, you know, and then you look at a few examples of, you know, large companies that have been breached, like Sony. And, you know, six months later, a year later, two years later, their share price is actually higher than what yeah. it was before the breach. Yeah. So the executives and the directors are sitting back and going, you know what? You know, I've got a lot of cost pressures. I've got, you know, shareholder pressure and investor pressure to grow the top line. Um, every dollar I invest in cyber is not going to necessarily deliver that, right? Because it's, it's kind of like buying insurance. You, you're doing a whole bunch of things. You know, everyone wants house insurance. It's, you, you have to have it, a car insurance, right? But it's, it's, you're not never happy about spending that money, right? Right. Right. <laughs> you know, because you think, well, I'm spending this money every year and like my house hasn't burned down. Right. It's still fine. It's still fine. So, you know, I, I think that's why, right? Like that, I think that's why. So that, you know, that's, that's why like a lot of the, the cyber hasn't sort of, you know, done even the basics well, right? Like it used to be basically government and uh, finance were the only ones that really worried about cybersecurity. And it was mainly mm. driven by regulation. And yeah. I think that's slowly changing now, uh, you know, with COVID, 
there was and the, the growth of ransomware and it's so easy to monetize now with cryptocurrencies as well it's really is a business so yeah. i think you know you're starting to see a lot more companies just be hit uh speculatively right like you know, it, it can be a council, it can be a school, it can be a hospital, and they can just get hit by ransomware because, you know, it's just there. They're just an opportunistic target, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what we've seen now is like a lot more focus in, in terms of across the board going, if I store some customer data, if I have some sensitive functionality, I need some basics of cybersecurity at minimum. Um, and I think regulation will play a big role in this as well, right? Like I, I love what Claire's done recently in Australia, you know, bringing us up to a world standard in terms of like the GDPR and saying, you yeah. know, raising the, the fines from $2 million to, you know, $50 million Australian and and up to 30% of your turnover. That's less revenue, basically not even profits um so now that that's what moves the needle at the board level right in my view like mm. you know it's it's really easy for me to build a business case if i can go up to the board of directors and say actually you might get fined 30 percent of your revenue even if there's a one percent chance of that happening you know put this investment in to try and prevent that from happening right so mm. i think that that'll help right so yeah and and so do you think that you know, businesses are taking more of a, a reactive approach rather than, you know, being proactive with such things as what we're seeing today. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, again, it's, it's the nature of humans, right? Like, if you if you, you saw it with, like, the COVID shutdowns, it's like, you know, the governments were blamed. Oh, why did you shut down? Like, our hospital system was fine, right? Like, you, your analogy I use often is, like, you get more credit for putting out a fire than preventing a fire. Yeah, <laughs> so I course. think it's just natural that, like, until there is a real-world incident, until there's a fine, until, like, your company actually gets affected or one of your suppliers, then it's, like, why are you spending this money? Like, why are you putting resources into something that could be better spent elsewhere, right? So yeah. um, I think that's just natural. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I guess, you know, during my time also when it comes to this recruitment space and, and even when it comes to cybersecurity, I would speak to candidates and they would say, you know, they're not giving us enough budget to be able to do what we need to do. Do you yeah. think that there is a lack of focus for many organizations or where do you think that the issue actually stems from? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, right? Like it is budget. For sure, right? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, like don't listen to anyone that says it's not budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it always comes down to budget, right? Because budget allows you to do resources and, and resources allow you to do things. Um, you know, you need to be able to have really great people. You need to build good processes. You need to have great technology. Um, and why is there not enough budget allocated to cybersecurity? Like I said, right? It's it's standard economics. It's it's mm -hmm. scarce resources. It's opportunity cost. It's you know, cybersecurity tends to be one of these things that's very low likelihood, but high impact, gotcha. right? So if you ever read like Nassim Taleb, like I love his books, and he's got a book called Anti Fragile, and he talks about how bad humans are at kind of you know assessing those type of tail risks. Right. We're just bad at it. <laughs> right. So okay. when you if you're a board of director or you're an executive and you've got a budget and you're trying to allocate it, um, it's it's a hard decision to try to come up with that. And I think, yeah, that's that's where, you know, I'm a very free market guy. <laughs> I, right, I don't okay. like a lot of regulation and government, but okay. in this is one of those, I think, market failure type events, especially when you're talking national data, right? Like yeah. you're talking like kids' medical details. Like yes. that's, that's not good. <laughs> So well, is, companies, is there a lack yeah. of care that, you know, is there a lack of care that we, you know, the organizations, the board of directors or what have you have a lack of care that they don't think that if there is a breach, this customer data goes to, you know, the dark web that, you know, or maybe it's not seen as, as important as profitability within an organization. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I don't think so. Like, yeah. I, I think genuinely people, like everyone I've ever worked for and generally the more senior you go, um, the more they care, <laughs> yeah, the more okay. risk averse they are. Like, um, and these days, like cybersecurity is a board level topic, right? Like, uh, you know, I've had lots of executives telling, you know, they, they say at every board meeting, this is the number one topic that comes up. So I don't think it's a lack of caring. Um, okay. I think it's just the realities of running a profitable business, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, there's always pressure to grow the top line. There's always pressure to 
uh, you know, reduce costs, um, you know, uh, inflation is really high at the moment yes. in globally. So that's pushing up, you know, producer prices, um, it makes your supplier costs are going up. Um, you know, you might not be able to raise prices in a competitive environment. So that's the business realities that these leaders are kind of dealing with every day. And, mm. and cyber is just a small part of that. Like it, okay. it is like they're experts in managing risk, right? Like every day they're managing risk. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's a lack of caring. I think it's, you know, um, it's trying to find that balance, right? It's trying to find the things that are most effective, best return on cyber investment as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, within a number of organizations, you know, that I've worked across, you know, IT will get an allocated budget. And then that allocated budget is then, um, you know, spun off into the multiple streams that they have. Do you think that it would be advantageous that, you know, you almost separate IT and cybersecurity and then they get their own budget? Yeah, I mean, this is an issue that I think a lot of companies have been dealing with, like, and it, it comes even before these attacks, right? Like, I've had lots of conversations with CISOs about this. Um, I've advised a lot of people around this sort of operating model. To me, like, there's no silver bullet, right? Mm. Like, as often in life, like, there's pros and cons to each one. So you could have your cybersecurity department effectively sitting within risk, within finance, yes. sort of outside of technology, and there's an argument for that, uh, you know, because like they're separate from technology that can govern technology, you know, technology tends to sort of have a lot of its budget, as you kind of said, like it's on cap and refresh, right? Which yeah, is basically, correct. you know, keeping systems up to date, reducing incidents, automate to reduce cost. So there's very little different drivers when you're coming from a cybersecurity perspective and you're sort of saying, I want to reduce risk. Right. Um, that doesn't resonate so well with like cutting real costs or doing yeah. investing in something that. So that's the argument for for taking cybersecurity outside of technology. Um, but to me, yeah, it, it you know, I remember having this conversation once um, with a, a really good sizer from a bank. Um, you know, we were on uh, on our way somewhere and I'm like, you know, uh, hey, um, one of the things that's been bugging me is like, why are the security architects sitting within you know, cyber within technology, right? Why are they not under enterprise architecture? And he's yeah, like, right. because they're too important to me. <laughs> Basically. Really? Yeah. So he's yeah. like, you know, it's that old adage. Like if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Right? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, that is the okay. planning function. So basically he's saying, you know, I need those architects because they are what drives my vision, my technology, like my sort of roadmaps. They're, they're what sets the direction. They're what chooses the technology. Right. So, um, and see, I, 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 my personal opinion is like, I don't like where the industry kind of goes where, hey, security is everybody's problem. Let's do all this education. I'm like, hey, if you're hiring a grad out of uni and paying him a few hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars in a bonus to sit on a trading desk, you don't really want her like, you know, spending half her time like working out a password to get into something. Like, I don't want her working out cybersecurity. <laughs> like, right, I just want right. my cybersecurity to work. And I want yeah. her doing what she does best, right? Which is making money for the business. Um, so to me, that means like you need a lot of technology, you need automation, you need secure by default, like, right? So you need that security to work as an invisible layer, protecting mm. the company, allowing the business to do what the business does best, right? So, yeah. and when you're talking about that, you need, you need to sit in technology. So why would you have cybersecurity that's, you know, architecting, designing, embedding technologies, you know, putting in a lot of these things? Why would you have that kind of function sitting outside of technology, right? Like, and I've always like to do anything useful. I need to work with a cross-functional group. I need to work with the people that look after end user computing. I need to work with hosting. I need to work with cloud. I need to work with networks. All of those teams are in technology, right? And you're going to get a lot more buy-in when you're one of the team. Yeah, gotcha. You're one of us. You're not right. You're not risk or you're not You're compliant. not external. You're not external. You're not the police officer. You're, you're working with them to improve. You're down in the trenches, you know? You need that kind of thing. But I think there is a middle path. As with mm. most things in life, right? Uh, I think cyber should be within uh, technology, but I don't. I think you know, CISO should regularly, if not every time, report to the board audit committee, mm. right? So they should have a line in, an independent line in, through to compliance and risk, right? Um, and if the executives or technology are not willing to fund, um, you know, a, a cyber project, then I think the board can step in and say, 
it's a board funded project, right? Because we think it's important to protect our customer data, for example, right? Um, yeah. And I think the metrics and the, the way you measure and reward people has to be different. You know, within cyber, it can't be like keeping like reducing costs, like technology costs or reducing technology incidents. It has to be much more about, can we do some measurable risk reduction? Are we gotcha. improving our maturity level, right? So if you mm. tie the CISOs, you know, sort of remuneration, your short-term, long-term incentives to those kind of measures, um, then I think you're going to get a much better results, right? So, so you're almost saying that you think that in terms of a KPI process for the cybersecurity team, that there needs to be almost measures in terms of, let's say you conduct a phishing exercise and, you know, the open rate was reduced by a certain number of percentage. And that's how you guys should be measured in terms of your productivity back to the organization. Look, I mean, there's there's an old law, right? I can't remember what it's called. I think it's Godwin's law or something like that. On Wikipedia, you can find it, which is as soon as the measure becomes the focus, the measure mm. loses all value. Right. <laughs> so right, it's, right. it's really, really tricky to, to, to get the right measures and metrics because if you make it what you suggested, which is the number of phishing um, things that are reported, okay, it sounds good on paper, but like what is the behavior that's going to encourage? That's going to probably encourage the security team to run maybe less phishing campaigns, make them easier, you know, give people ticks and trips. So oh, everything is reported, 100% thing, great. I can collect my bonus, right? So yeah. um, I'd rather much more sort of objective measures that are much more aligned with the actual end goal, which is really okay. protecting customer data, stopping a major security breach, like being able to recover back to normal in a short period of time. Um, so I think the best proxy measures that you're going to have of those is things like, you know, measurable risk reduction, right? So you have an external someone come in and say, yeah, you've actually improved your maturity against an objective gotcha. framework like NIST or, you know, you're defending against these MITRE attack techniques effectively across all your systems, regardless of where they're running. Um, you can show and demonstrate that. Okay, that that's pretty good. That's hard to game that measure. And, and I think that's sort of linking much closer with the actual end outcome that you want, right? So Okay, yeah, no, wonderful. Very good, very good. Now, I guess with what is going on uh, around the world and, and especially, you know, more so within Australia, do you think that more Australian businesses will now be seen as an easy target? And do you believe that there will be more attacks in the future because we are seen as a potential easy target? Yeah. And again, I think the short answer to that is yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, the longer answer, I think, is is like if you look at a place like Singapore, Taiwan, Shenzhen, Bangalore, like they have this amazing, vibrant tech product sector. Right. Yeah. I think Australia has these incredible advantages. We're a developed economy. We have stable, relatively stable politics. We have good education levels. We have a high wealth per capita. Like we should be building much more successful tech companies, right? Especially since we've got the internet. We've had the internet yeah, for 20 yeah, years. Yeah. You, you don't have to be constrained by your population of 25 million. We can make products that we can sell to the rest of the world. And there are some successful Australian startups. Like Atlassian is a great example yeah. there of making yeah. a, a product that almost every tech company uses. And it's, you know, it started in Australia. That's great, right? So I think, yeah, when you have a country that's relatively rich, but has a pretty small tech sector, Gotcha. Like it's an obvious target. Right? Gotcha. So, gotcha. you know, I, I think we will see like, um, and, and I don't think it's just Australia. Like I think the threat landscape is, you know, that's a phrase that we always use, but, you know, it still remains true, which is that opportunistic crime is just so much easier now. And ransomware changed the game, you know, ransomware right. plus crypto changed the game because it, now you can just, you have a simple avenue to monetize. Right. Mm. It's it's so easy. And what we're seeing in the industry is that like the the, the threats are becoming more specialized. I mean, yeah. I firmly believe specialization is like the best thing that humans have ever invented. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's gone from like, you know, you used to have to do your own food collection to your own clothes to everything. It was very inefficient. Now you go to Coles and you buy some food and it's right. grown by a farmer that does it at huge scale and it's relatively cheap, right? Like it allows mm. people to specialize. So specialization is great. But anyway, we're seeing that in the crime industry, right? So what's happening is you'll have initial access brokers. So you'll have people that just gain entry into a company's systems and then they'll sell that. 
they'll sell that access to someone who can then go in and put the ransomware in. And then maybe they'll sell that <laughs> to someone right. who's actually really good at getting the data out. Right. So you're starting to see these crews work together and specialize. Um, so basically, like, it's an easy way to make money. Uh, anytime mm -hmm. there's an easy way to make money, you're going to have people drawn to it. Right. Um, so I think it's not just Australia. I think, you know, we will continue to see cybercrime sort of go up um, mm -hmm. across the world. And yeah, unfortunately, I think these incidents are highlighting that Australia is maybe a target rich environment, um, you know, and it's, there's nothing like, it's like a gold rush. <laughs> yeah. Once, yeah. Once yeah. someone finds a bit of gold, they go, hmm, yes. okay, other criminals would be kind of drawn to that. Right. So right. like, I think it's a really smart move that Australian government's doing things like making rents, paying a ransom, out, outlawing that. Like that's okay. really smart in my view, right. because it's like, well, if you pay ransoms, you're going to just encourage more people to steal your data. <laughs> okay. Right. right. So, yeah. So you think so that that's I, almost a better deterrent not to pay these ransomwares because it absolutely. will stop. Okay, right. So you think that that, that is a positive, right? Okay. Yeah, okay. definitely. I mean, do do better. Do better not to get your data stolen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But that's always but number like, one. That's number one. But don't pay the ransom, right? Because you're just going to encourage. And I think as from a taking a step back from like an individual company or an individual's data to a national level, I think yeah. it's really smart for a government to say, hey. Uh, we're going to make it illegal to pay a ransom. Don't even think about it. Insurance companies are not going to pay ransoms. Like, And again, it's that old adage of like, you don't necessarily need to be the fastest. You just need to be faster than your mate, right? Yeah, gotcha, <laughs> you're getting, gotcha. You're getting chased by a bear. Like, If there are countries that are still allowing legal to pay ransoms and some countries are not, well, that's a great way to avoid being the number one target, right? So, you know, I think that's then, a good thing. So, But then, then does that also then leave the consumer at risk because if the organizations aren't paying up front, it's then the individual's data that is then being compromised. That individual data is then being leaked on the dark web. Therefore, yeah. then you have fraudulent activity on the individual. And then that individual then has to pay the price in terms of, hey, but it wasn't me that got the data um, breached. It was these guys. So why am I yeah. out of pocket now? And why is my um, you know credit score or whatever it may be now affected? Yeah, definitely. And, and it's not fair. You know, life's not fair. Like yeah. bad things happen to good people. Like, you know, there is plenty of examples of these type of things where it's, it's just not fair, right? Like mm. you gave your data to a company in, in good faith. Yeah. You trusted them to protect it and they didn't. Um, yeah. and, and now you're the one that pays the price. Like, yeah, look, I mean, that's where I think regulation comes into play, right? Like, you know, where the government's saying, well, actually, these companies can get fined up to 30% of their turnover. Okay, that's a pretty big incentive to for them to, A, not store, like, more data than they need. <laughs> yeah, to exactly. invest in cybersecurity, right? Um, and then there's the recovery mechanisms, right? Like, I was big when, like, the Optus breach came out saying, hey, yes. No one likes Equifax because Equifax got hacked as well. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, they have this credit monitoring service. I use it. It costs the same as Netflix a month. Uh, I think it's a worthwhile investment. And look, I mean, I my personal opinion is, you know, companies like, um, you know, Optus or Medibank or whatever, especially Optus because that was more like driver's license and that kind of data. Like they should have offered free credit protection to individuals. Yes. Right. Um, so... And, yeah. and do you think that there may be, you know, especially with these large breaches with these organizations, I almost feel that there's almost a less of an education from these organizations to these individuals that have had their the breach happen to, to then know what to do now. What what do I do now? All they, is, they have been given, we have been breached, but now the consumer is like, well, okay, I've been breached, but what do I do? What What, what can I yeah. do? Yeah. Yeah. And look, I mean, I think there's been some reasonable communications. Like I was hit with a Medibank breach personally. Yes. So I've gone through those emails. Name, and, yes. You know, they've, they've done a reasonable job. You know, I think they link back to things like the ASD, various sort of different articles and saying, you know, how to be safe. Like to me, again, like I don't like anything that requires a person to take action, especially when it's not their job and it's right. not their fault. <laughs> right. Yeah. I would love it if it, it just happened to them in the background. You're yeah. saying, hey, we've bought some credit protection for you. Here it is. Like we're paying for it. If anyone tries to take out a loan using your, you know, compromised details, you'll get an alert. Um, you know, like that kind of thing. I, I like that a lot more. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So 
what can organizations do who might be small to mid-tier organizations that actually don't have large budgets like these large corporations do to help minimize being a potential threat? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think that, again, the short answer is like work smarter rather than spend more. Um, yes. And like, there's a really good opportunity. I think, you know, don't view yourself as a, a small company with not much budget that can't do anything. Therefore, just give up, throw your hands up. Like there's always little things that you can do. And it's like, I, I took back to the example of like, you know, if you look at like mobile payments, they're, they're much better in Southeast Asia, in China, in yeah. India, in Africa than they are in the Western developed country. Why is that? Because they leapfrog technology. Right, they they didn't have this legacy of credit cards and stuff. They just went straight to mobile payments. So you can see similar stories in things like, you know, uh, African countries that use mobile networks rather than building all this fixed wire. Right, like they don't have. So in a way, you're at an advantage if you're a small company because you're more nimble. You don't have the bureaucracy. You don't have the legacy. Right. So especially with cloud and SaaS, there's lots of little things that you can do. There's lots of open source. There's startups. Like I wrote a blog post and maybe you can link it to it in the show notes. Yeah, so I, I just sort of went through the top three sort of things that you can do and they're really simple things that will stop you getting hacked or at yeah, least greatly good. reduce the likelihood so i think the key message though is don't give up do something <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you're right. right right yeah okay all right very good now there is you know there's always a topic around cyber security and data governance uh, and what you know both are how do you think that the two work and how do they both affect a business yeah, so I mean, to me, like data governance is basically like a superset of cyber. It's kind of like a foundation that cybersecurity sits on top of. Um, yeah. So like, you know, data governance like deals with the whole aspect of like what data does an organization collect? And, and there's been some great debate recently and it's it's an old trope that's been put up again, which is, you know, data is not the new oil, data is the new uranium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, right. It's radioactive. Yeah, like, wow. Yeah. He collect what you need you know, and this is the law in Australia, actually. Yeah. The Australian privacy principles, at least when it comes to personally identifiable data, says already collect what you need, use it for the purpose that you're using it for. And when you don't need it anymore, get rid of it. Mm. <laughs> right? Like simple yeah. to say, but hard to do, um, you know, especially yeah. with data retention. Anyone that's worked in a corporate knows how far data spreads. You know, it's in spreadsheets. It's in various databases. Yes. It's copied across systems. It's it's in backups. And, and everyone loves this, you know, in Australia, this seven-year Corporations Act thing. Oh, mm. Corporations Act says, like, you know, data that's material to your financial statements, keep it for seven years. Okay, well, IT people kind of like a simple rule. Keep everything yeah, for seven right. years. <laughs> yeah, okay. But guess what? Like, it probably wasn't a good idea to keep, like, someone's, you know, Medicare details for seven years when all you needed was a 100-point check. Yeah, right. Right? 100 point check, mark yes in the database, delete the data, you're done. Right? So do you, you don't think, have do the you data. Think that, that may need to be changed, that seven year uh, reform, whereby keeping a hold of that data may be almost redundant in a way. I think the way it's being interpreted and enforced needs to be changed. Um, right. right. Like, I don't think that the law is not a problem. Like, the law mm -hmm. says, you know, corporations act, if it's material to your financial statements, keep it for seven years. That, that's fine. Like, that's usually your financial transactional data. It's not like the really bad stuff, like your personally identifiable data about customers. It's not credit cards necessarily. It's not medical procedures, you know. Don't keep that stuff for seven yeah. years. Yeah. Right? Okay. okay. You know? So I think that, I think data governance is, is important in that. Like, you know, what do you collect? How do you keep it? And then the hard part, which is what is your operating model? Like who owns what data in the organization? Who is the data owner for customer data within your organization? Is there one person? Mm -hmm. You need one person, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and it gets difficult with. So I think that's where data data governance really plays a plays a role. Like, who are the data stewards? What's the racy? What's the operating model? And then yes. ideally, cybersecurity just takes those principles and and enforces those through technology, people, and process, right? So yeah. unfortunately, where you're often in a place where the organization doesn't have data good governance, no one knows who owns what data. No one knows mm. what data is there. How long we should keep it for? All of these kind of things. It might be in some vague policy somewhere, but but it's certainly not enforced across the board, right? So cybersecurity ends up coming up with things like information classification standards gotcha. and policies and things like that. And you, But you're building on shaky foundations. Um, but at that at the same time, I'm saying 
don't just give up. <laughs> like don't yeah. don't yeah. do any cyber because you don't have good data governance. Like do both. Like start small, iterate, like work on it, but definitely think about your data governance as well as your cybersecurity, right? So you almost want an asset register for the people that hold the actual asset or have access to the asset and and let that be notified to the organization. So when um things start to bubble up or emerge, then you know who to run back to. Yeah, absolutely. But do that in an automated, sustainable way, right? Like the yeah. biggest problem is that organizations will go through an exercise and say, huh, what we need to do is identify all the data in the organization, classify it and who owns it. Great. It's out of date in one day. <laughs> so Got think to. about like how you can automate these. There's now like technology that will enable you to use natural language processing and scanning of this data. You can automatically classify it. You can think about it in terms of location. Oh, okay. My legal department stores all the legal stuff in this SharePoint folder. Let's automatically tag that as legally sensitive data, right? Then you yeah. know where it goes, where it shouldn't go, all of that kind of stuff. So use technology to automate and make these things sustainable, right? Don't do it as a one-off exercise, right? No, very good. All right. Now, I guess for people that may be interested in cybersecurity, have no idea about it, how would you describe it? Um, the shortest description is we stop the bad guys and keep the customer data safe. Right? Very cool. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's basically risk management in my view, right? Like, and, and it's really great. I would encourage anyone that's got even a small interest to, to look into it because there's so many diverse roles in cyber, right? Like, um, you know, there's everything from the sexy stuff like the, uh, you know, offensive hacking to the incident response to kind of what I do, which is a lot of architecture, governance, strategy, design to running systems, building systems, and, you know, um, there's metrics, there's governance, you know, and, and I read some fa stat like there's 3,400 excess roles that people, companies are looking for than people yeah. just in Australia, you know? Yeah. So if you're smart and you work hard and you got an interest in technology and, and um, you know, then yeah, get into it. It's We need more. We need more. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we so. definitely <laughs> need a lot more. Um, all right. I know that uh, the time is ticking, but what do you love most about being within cybersecurity? For me, it's all about the people. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I, I think it's a lot like being a teacher or a doctor. I think the best people in cyber really, really care, right? Yeah. Like they care about keeping the customer safe, but keeping the co company safe. It's not about collecting a paycheck or getting a risk acceptance or ticking a compliance box. The best people are really like passionate and they want to make a difference right so that's what i love like working with those people um, very good and lastly how can people reach out to you uh, i've started a new blog after 10 years i started writing again so it's rocky.substack.com uh, uh, or i'm Wonderful. on linkedin or i just started on mastodon actually it seems like the security people have moved okay. to infosec.exchange uh, right or you can look at me up on Twitter. It's Rocky S on Twitter. But Twitter, I'm a bit more like politics, economics, a few other things. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Uh, if you want to stay cyber, yeah, LinkedIn or the blog. That'd be great. We'll link all your details down below.